Dinkins, uh, prior to receiving his THM and uh, DTS, uh, he and his wife Paula were missionaries and appointed with OMF International in Thailand, where they started a church planting ministry with leprosy patients in central Thailand. In 1987, they transitioned into a Bible teaching ministry at the Bangkok Bible College and the seminary, where Larry served as academic dean and then dean of the seminary. In 1995, Larry finished his classroom work for his Ph.D. at Biola University, which allowed him to start a theological education by extension program in northern Thailand. Larry acted as director of the newly formed Chiang Mai Theological Seminary in 2000 before the family evacuated in 2002. As a result, Larry and Paula have been acting as mobilizers and recruiters for OMF in Southern California as well as in the Midwest. Their goal and their prayer desire is to return to Thailand in 2007. They're involved in a number of the Thai churches in the Los Angeles area, and Larry teaches seminars on walk through the Bible, perspectives, prayer counseling, as well as a comparative religion course on Buddhism and Christianity. Larry has authored two missions books, as well as a number of magazines and journal articles. And Paula has been active in various prayer ministries, such as Moms in Touch International and mentoring of new missionaries. They have four children, Andy, Tim, Amber, and Titus. And we are so delighted, Larry, that you're here. Would you uh, come and minister to us again today? Would you welcome Dr. Larry Dinkins? Well, talking about the book, I've written a couple of books, and this is the book I think really applies to Dallas Seminary, Help My Halo is Slipping. <laughs> the sequel is Help Me Find My Halo, or I've, re I've lost my halo somewhere. And if you would like to get it, it'll be in the bookstore. If you'd like me to sign it, that'll be an extra dollar, because you know my bonus has been pretty low <laughs> over the last period of time. <laughs> you know, although it was... 30 years ago, I can remember the first WEC-type conference I went to and the excitement that I had about coming into that week, mainly for the reason of exegetical papers that needed to be done. <laughs> and also, I liked the international food that was served. And one of the things I love to do, and I've seen many of you doing it, is going around getting the trinkets that you have in the different booths that are around. And I already have my world ball. <laughs> and then I went up to the IMB thing, and they had some... They had a Frisbee, and I realize right now the OMF booth doesn't have a lot of people coming by. So next year, I'm thinking of going to Thailand and getting Thai boxing gloves to <laughs> hand out next year. Kickboxing gloves, right? <laughs> well, last reason is there's snow at Vail that's very nice, and I remember a lot of people skipping out during that week. I was glad that I didn't skip out because that was an initial interest in missions, that first conference. By the fourth year, I sure wasn't going to miss the missions conference because that was a point that Paul and I were making that very difficult decision to go to the country of Thailand. That decision didn't come easy, and I really saw that recently. Within the last three years, my, Paul, my Paula was in this cancer treatment at the City of Hope out in L.A., and there was a Christian nurse that was ministering to her at one of the low points of her treatment. Paula described our journey into missions and the fact that when we were in our late 20s, we made that decision to go to Thailand. And she said, I'm really enamored with this because when I was a young person, I was thinking of medical missionary missions. But there were some obstacles that came up and me and my husband decided we stay here in the States. And what impresses me is, Paula, you and your husband decided to step out in faith even amid all the obstacles. You know, if you think about the hoops that you have to jump through, if you think about the financial aspects of going to the mission field, if you think about MK care, which is very hard, if you think about things like your safety, your health, and parents, 
then I don't think you'll ever think about going to a place like central Thailand with leprosy people. But a journey of a thousand miles always starts with what? One step. That first step might be a pretty scary step. It's a step of faith. But I'm very glad that Paul and I made that decision my last year at Dow Theological Seminary. Dr. Harrell was talking about the Trinity and its relationship to the Missio Dei. And he sent me his notes, and I really appreciated the chance to kind of go through them and just kind of meditate on particularly my understanding of God and kind of the development of it from when I was a little child all the way through my mission experience. And I want to say I appreciate the freebies of Dallas Seminary to the missionaries, and I happened to open this book that they gave us on the first day. I turned to the first paragraph, and it says, each of us has a God image, a picture of God in our minds. Some of us have a good God image. Others have a very distorted God image. Different people have different pictures of God. So what I'd like to do is kind of let you follow along with me as I kind of trace my conception of God and how it developed, my understanding of the Trinity, my understanding of the Godhead. And it started out in a very simplistic way. As a little child, I thought of God as Santa Claus. Now, don't look in Chafer's Systematic Theology for a category of Santa Claus for God. But that's the way I thought about him, a, a kind of a grandfather, the old white beard, a very benevolent. He knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you have been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. And I didn't want coal in my stocking, and so that was my conception of making sure God was pleased with me. I entered into the next phase, which I, for want of a better word, as a religious God. I was junior high in high school, very much involved in the church. I knew the hoops that I had to jump through. My mother grabbed me by the ear and forced me to go to Sunday school. I went through the catechism. I even became the president of my MYF group, but I didn't know Jesus Christ in a personal way. I knew him in that external type way. And that has been a real help and empathy with the Buddhist people who live a very external type existence in their religion. I can empathize with them. And then coming to Oklahoma University, my sophomore year, a man comes into my fraternity house, he shares the four laws, and I trust Christ. I'm disciple within crusade. And they talk to me about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They have me in the word of God and I am actually feeding on that word and God is speaking to me and they taught me about prayer so that I really understood that you could communicate and you could share your deepest heart's desires with God in prayer, in this communication. And to this day, I build off of all that I learned from Campus Crusade in that personal relationship. But somewhere I sensed that there was still a missing piece, a kind of a gap in this transcendent God and yet this very personal God. That brings me to my theological God. I came to Dallas Theological Seminary and I was totally fascinated with the theological systems that they were talking about. Back then we had the four pointers and the five pointers. Yesterday we had our drama and they were just kind of laughing and kidding about, are you unlimited, are you limited? Well, that wasn't a real funny type issue back 30 years ago. <laughs> and we had some very spirited discussions upon that issue. And I would get deeply into those. And this was kind of the Hal Lindsey period, and so eschatology obviously was a, a very hot topic, and that was a huge area of debate. And when we were at our coffee type times, we were obviously going back and forth about all of these theological issues. I love that. I have a very vivid picture of this sacred place. Back then, 600 men, all in suits, dark suits, <laughs> no women. And you women have been a great addition to the scene here in DTS. And we would see it, <laughs> yeah, okay, go ahead and clap for that. That's a male clapping there, one male. <laughs> and we sang, crown him with many crowns four-part harmony with an organ. And as I think about my times of worship, I cannot compare hardly any time of worship with that experience here in this chapel. 
I was very much a type A, and many of my friends were type A, obsessive compulsive, alpha males. Like I said, no women here, so we could really be alpha males. All in these dark suits, performance oriented, highly motivated, critical thinkers. I can remember my favorite book was this Attributes of God by Sharnock. My son brought it home from Master Seminary the other day, and I thought, how did I even wade into that thing? And yet that was my person. That's what I was thrilled about during this time of theology. That has held me instead throughout my entire missionary career. I build upon it on a daily basis. I went to the PhD meeting yesterday, and still this question comes up. If you go to a primitive field like Thailand, will you be able to use a PhD? Brethren, you will use it hugely in your life. Are you linguistically oriented? Then go to the Bangkok Bible College, look at all of the materials and realize, you know, we can teach Thai just using, uh, teach Greek just using Thai. So I taught a course without using any English helps, the Greek language. That will stretch you. But I had to draw upon all that I learned from this school in order to do that. I did six years of church planning, doing TEE all through that. I also did distance learning. I was in three different Bible schools, and I had the privilege of being a dean of a seminary and starting a seminary. I've done 60 different seminars on walk through the Bible in places like Mongolia. The other day, a man tapped me on the shoulder in L.A. His name was Joshua Moon. He had been in my class in 1993 in Mongolia, walked through the Bible. He still remembered part of it. And he was an elder in his church with a family, and he was planning to go to Fuller Seminary. I've done 20 or more courses. I was, as I was in the PhD seminar yesterday, I thought, what a luxury it is to specialize in Old Testament. Because invariably, you go to the mission field, you're not a specialist, you are a generalist. And if you think you're Old Testament, invariably you'll end up teaching New Testament. And if New Testament, you'll invariably teach Old Testament. And yet that has been a very enriching experience. Plus all of the cultural aspects that highlight those scriptures and bring it off of the page. So I had a Santa Claus God, a religious God, personal relationship, theological. Then I went to Thailand, got the language. And for want of a better word again... I had a category I call power encounter God. Like most new missionaries going into a new field, you hear about spiritual warfare on this side, but then when you cross the pond, you realize there's a whole new dimension to spiritual warfare. I did very well in my angelology class, but let me tell you, I did not understand demonology. There's a tremendous contrast between the angel of light and his very subtle deception in this country and his very much frontal attack coming in as a roaring lion seeking the nationals to devour, and oftentimes the missionaries as well. There's a book that I read many years ago. It's written by Merrill Unger, and his handbook was kind of the gold standard for our study, and there's been a lot more since Merrill Unger. And Merrill Unger, I think, had some question marks about all these things that were happening in regard to teaching about angelology and so finally he did the deep research he interviewed with missionaries and someone who was fairly skeptical came up with a book called demons in the world today still a very good book you know in the states we realize that miracles are fairly rare but when you get to the field and you work in a place like Thailand you realize that people are having visions they're having dreams there are miraculous escapes. There are miraculous healings. I sat down with my IMB friend yesterday, and he said, let me just remind you, Larry, of the, three, of the ten universal principles of church planning movements, which should be foremost in our thinking as we come to a missions conference. And he reminded me that a part of a movement of the Spirit of God, a church planning movement, there will be signs and wonders. There will be miracles. He also said one of our principles that we often overlook is the missionaries will suffer. And we don't like to emphasize that particular universal principle. I went to Thailand, I joined a deliverance team in a local church, and I saw firsthand things that I would, thought I would never see except maybe in the movies. 
Someone who goes to a Hindu temple, opens himself up, and then he speaks in multiple Hindu dialects. And then he tries to crawl out of the room like a snake on the ground. I went to a place called Burley Lum, out in the northeast part of Thailand. And I was preaching on Daniel and the fact that Daniel was not willing to take the food that was sacrificed to idols, the high food of the king. And at the moment that I mentioned that, I saw a woman on the back row faint over just out of it. And they grab, grabbed her and dragged her out of the room. I've written a whole article about that experience because the woman turned out to be the pastor's wife. Having been involved with these type of power encounters, I had a whole new dimension to my understanding of God opened up. It strengthened my faith, and I believe that it got, ready, got me ready for another phase, and for want of a better word again, experiential God. I'm doing seminars now on the Father heart of God. There was no way I could even approach that subject maybe 25 years ago. I now understand it better, and I love to talk on the motherhood of God, the fatherhood of God, Talk about daddy, talk about Abba, because Jesus is my bridegroom. I am his bride. And this whole idea of intimacy and this passionate personal relationship has become much more real. And I, I really believe it's a lot because of that missionary experience. You know, Paul, as a Pharisee, he knew a lot about God. But when he got to Damascus and on that road, he really had a personal encounter with God. Paul loved to talk about knowing God, that I might know him in the power of the resurrection of fellowship. I count all things refuge in light of the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus. Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. But then the follow-up to that, I will be exalted among the nations. In my counseling, not just the demonic aspect, in my counseling I began to see things that really opened myself up in, that, in this regard. They helped me, as it were, add a missing puzzle piece to my understanding of the Trinity, of the person of the Godhead. Once I was doing counseling, this was one of the first times I ever did prayer counseling at a deep level with someone who had a lot of dark history and a lot of hurt, trauma, and wounding. The first experience lasted two hours and we dealt with the occult. The next one we saw some horrific sins like abortion and sexual deviations. And in that session, we sat with this woman for five hours. I didn't know the human eyeball could hold that much water. And in the whole process, Jesus ministered at a deep level to this lady, this new believer, two years old in the Lord. And at one point, she, was, she saw that in her memory the most difficult time probably in her life where she was suicidal, depressed, in an Asian city. And at that point, in an unusual way, Jesus showed up in a vision. I didn't understand a lot about visions in my previous studies. And I certainly do not tell the Thai people to seek out visions. If they come, certainly receive them. But I tell the Thai, you found your life not upon visions of individuals, but upon the Word of God. But as he generously allows dreams and visions, and we need to be sensitive to that. In this situation, Jesus showed up at this, in this lady's memory. She, and Jesus walked up to her. He grabbed her head and lifted it up as she was looking at the ground. And then she fell into the embrace of Jesus. This lady was not theologically sophisticated. And yet, she just started to describe to me, she said, Pa kong pra Yesu krit yap mak. And when she said that in Thai, it means the cloth of his robe is this rough material. It's not this kind of modern material. And Paula and myself, we leaped out of our chair, and I was just floating around the room because this theologically unsophisticated Thai lady, a couple of years old in the Lord, was experiencing Jesus Christ at a level I didn't think really was possible. And to this day, I don't fully understand. But as I looked in the scripture, it reminds me sort of the theophanies in the Old Testament. At the point when God's people were under pressure, when the point when they were under stress, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when he was in that fiery furnace, there wasn't a prophet outside the furnace that read from a scroll and encouraged them. There wasn't a voice from heaven, although God could have done that. 
But Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate form came down into that furnace and he comforted and he encouraged his people at that moment of need. And I've seen in counseling situations this type of pattern, an unusual situation where they sense the truth of Jesus Christ dispelling the lies that they have had. And basically what we're talking about is that whole aspect of balancing the head and the heart. You know, Campus Crusade taught me about a personal relationship, that tangible connection, that close koinonia with God. But I had to admit, oftentimes it was in my head, it was cognitive. And if I thought about the omnipresence of Jesus Christ, I often would think of it in my imagination. I didn't have any category like I experienced when this woman was in this counseling. You know, it's easy to sing about God, but it's another thing to truly sing to God as I experienced just a few minutes ago. When I was in Campus Crusade, they showed me a train diagram, and I mastered that, taught it on many occasions. And as I look at it now, I realize in my mind they were little boxes, fact, faith, and feeling. And I was reminded that you never place those feelings and try to pull your train. And to this day, I understand that bedrock principle that's behind that. But I think unconsciously, I started to put God into little compartments and into little boxes. And I had way too much, I was way too wary about the subjective emotional aspect of a walk with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit obviously is not a force, but a person. I relied on the Holy Spirit to reveal truth to me. I could feel his comfort and his joy. In times of temptation, I saw the moral power of the Holy Spirit to help me out of those temptations. But I believe I missed the Holy Spirit's supernatural working. The power that I saw when the authority and the blood of Jesus Christ were used in deliverance sessions. And obviously, in counseling sessions, I saw something that was unique and, and new to me. I had inadvertently driven an artificial wedge between logic, cognitive processing of God, and the more subjective, emotional, and the more experiential relationship with God. Now, this is important because in Buddhist culture, there is so much philosophical thought, theoretical facts, and I had been, I think, subtly sucked into that. I had done the professional missionary thing. I had learned culture, I had learned language, I had jumped through the hoops, I had gone up the ladder, but some way, and I've talked to other people who have scheduled their midlife crisis much like mine, I've talked to many missionaries 20 or so years along the road, and it's pretty easy to get into a daily ritual and grind and instead of having the joy of the Lord as your strength, you're pretty well just pushing it out in a perfunctory way. And I have to admit, I got to points like that in my missionary career. Now I see that you can't compartmentalize God. You can't put him in a box. He has very creative ways of breaking down the walls of those boxes. There is no need to pit logic versus experience or rigorous mental cognitive processing with the emotional. A keen mind needs to be matched by the fire that is on heart for God. And the way I like to express it is you need to have the head of a scholar, the heart of an evangelist, and keep those in the proper tension. In fact, you can add a third dimension. You have to have the head, you have to have the heart, you also have to have the hands. And that's why it says that we need to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, with all the faculties. And instead of setting up some artificial distinction between the heart and the spirit and the mind, realize that they are used interchangeably. So that when I talk about this head of a scholar and heart of evangelist, I'm talking about a thinking heart. Brethren, a thinking heart. As I look in the scriptures, I see that replete through the entire Old Testament to New Testament. Men who were very much scholarly, and very much in tune with the word of God, but they had that balance. They were not heavy word and light spirit. They understood it's like an airplane that needs both wings, and there needs to be that proper tension and balance between those. I have 10 Bible churches. Some of them are concerned about me. 
but I like to tell them, yes, there are emotional, experiential aspects, but I do my best to keep them firmly tethered to an inner, inter, like cognitive understanding of the scriptures. Recently, I was talking with Dr. Walt Russell of Talbot Seminary about this talk. He's 20 years along in his ministry at Talbot. He was a Dallas guy. I looked in his office, and I've never seen an office that had as many books in it. I said, Walt, how many books do you have? And he looked at me very seriously, and in the end I wrote it down. He said, I have over 6,000 books. But as I look at these books, I ask, who was that person who had such a burning desire to gain all of this knowledge? I wanted to gain intellectual knowledge of God, but now I want to balance that with the experience of his power, particularly in ministry and in relationships. Walt used to be asked, what do you do, Walt, for a living? And he would always say, I teach Bible. He said, Larry, now I tell people, I teach people. I teach people the Bible. Because a definition of ministry is that we teach people, first and foremost. And we have to understand how to relate to people. Now, this is important because in Thailand, we're trying to train nationals to really have this head and this heart together. One time we had one of our graduates come back after a couple of years of ministry. He had a box of all of his books and notes. He came to the principal and he dumped them out on his desk and he said, I'm tired of this ministry. I'm giving it up. I thought that I could simply teach the word of God and it will handle these people problems. But for the last two years, all I've had is people problems. I'm tired of it. I'm giving it up. What we have to understand is we teach the Bible to people, people who have wounding, people who have demonic problems, people who have bondages and besetting sins. And we need to know how to relate to them. I was a pastoral ministries at this school, but at that point we didn't have a counseling department. And I appreciate the sensitivity to help us have that balance of understanding both scripture, word, spirit, and how to relate at hurt levels in people's lives. I still have very much a confidence in Isaiah 55, 11, that the word of God that goes forth from my mouth will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish what I have purposed it for. But what I realize as I send the word of God out in my preaching, now I look upon people's faces, and because of some of this counseling and some of my understanding of Thai culture, I realize there is a tremendously dark side to the Thai society. It's like... It's like a pie, and underneath the crust, there's so much there. And as people nod at me and agree with my teaching, underneath, I know that they're hurting. And brethren, I didn't understand how to get at those parts of the onion or those parts of the iceberg in the past. And now I'm just learning how to spend time working on those areas. Finally, I'd like to talk to you about E. Stanley Jones. Just recently was reading one of his books. He wrote many books on the kingdom of God. And I've already mentioned that Jesus mentioned the kingdom of God a hundred times. When Christianity is mentioned, it's always in a negative sense. And it's only mentioned three times. And I think we often set up artificial hoops for people to come through the Christian hoop before they can get into the kingdom of God. E. Stanley Jones had a tremendous grasp upon that concept. Once he was on a train near Moscow... And he was talking and having a debate with a very beautiful actress who was a very staunch communist. This was about 50 years ago. And each Stanley Jones was trying to build a bridge and love this lady. And so he was in this kind of religious debate with her. She realized that he was a very moral man. But he often talked about ideas and theories and different theologies. So at the end of the conversation, this lady turned to E. Stanley Jones, looked him in the eyes... And she said, I have one question for you. Are you an idealist or are, are you a realist? Well, this was before E. Stanley Jones had done his study. And so he thought for a moment, he thought about their conversation, and he said, well, I believe I'm an idealist. She immediately said, that is the close of our conversation, goodbye, because I am a realist. On the basis of that conversation... E. Stanley went back to the scriptures. And for two years, he studied on the kingdom of God. And what he realized in the teaching of Jesus Christ is he gave no luxury for us to idealists. 
There's no way that we can have theoretical theology floating around as our primary core cardinal part of our life. You see, he said, Jesus Christ was a stark realist. And I'd encourage you to read the Sermon on the Mount one more time and to realize how Jesus taught, obviously, cognitive. And he had the highest regard for the scriptures. And at the same time, he wanted us to have shoe leather to our Christian life. And that is what I cherish for each one of us, that we would have the balance of head and heart and hands. Let's pray. Father God, thank you again for the word of God. I pray, Lord, that you would shake up our compartmentalized boxes about you. We pray, Lord, that you would expand our understanding of the Trinity. You'd expand our understanding of the Missio Dei and just how we partner and fit into that. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would have shalom in our understanding of you, that we would have a holistic view and a biblical viewpoint that has balance and becomes a channel of blessing as people see the stark reality of Jesus Christ exemplified before their eyes. Would you do this in our time and in our place and in our space? For we pray in, pray in Jesus' name. Amen.